<clears throat> I just want to thank the organizers for at least letting us have even an online experience this year for IDM. Um, and I'm also um, pretty excited to be able to tell everybody about um, some of the opportunities uh, that are coming up for cryogenic detectors in the future. And so my talk is <clears throat> um, looking, looking sort of um, nearer long-term and long-term. And essentially when you're coming down to cryogenic detectors, there are sort of three signals that we're sort of looking for. We're looking either for nucleon scattering, electromagnetic scattering, or absorption. And depending on which signal it is that you're looking at, sort of dictates the mass range where um, you would be competitive or even being able to see that sort of signal. And each of these different signatures provides different um, challenges. So um, the types of needs that we have, um, we would want the ability to detect low energy dark matter nucleon coupling. So this requires us to detect small energy de depositions, and that requires low threshold detectors, detectors that are radiologically pure or radiogenically pure. Um, ideally, if you want to do dark matter nucleon couplings, you need a way to differentiate between electronic recoils and nuclear recoils in the detectors. And then in some cases, um, there are certain types of backgrounds that you really want to identify um, for example, alpha particles become really important for bubble chambers um, and being able to distinguish them from nuclear recoils. We also want to have the ability to detect dark matter electron coupling, and this is going even lower in the amount of energy um, that you would like to be able to measure in your detector. So it requires even lower threshold. And it also um, will require ultra pure targets. In all of these cases, noise becomes a problem. So you have both environmental and instrumental noise. And then finally, as always, we want to shield against radiogenics and cosmogenic backgrounds. Um, so things like position reconstruction and producialization can become very important. Um, there are a number of existing experience, experiments, and there are many initiatives that are going on in R&D. And in this talk, I'm only going to be able to highlight a few. So I want to start by talking about some of the experiments that are either online and going to be producing results soon, and then sort of move into um, some more speculative areas. And I thank um, Catherine and Rick for setting me up very nicely to give this talk. So one of the things that when we're looking at cryogenic detectors that really matters is the detection media. Um, we have a lot of work that's been going into looking for the canonical WIMP, which Catherine already told us about, and we have excluded large swaths of parameter spaces Rick had illustrated in the last talk. And the important thing is, is that we now know that there are a lot of plausible candidates that have um, mass lower than 10 GeV, and future cryogenic technologies um, are going to include a mix of materials. Um, many of those will have small but non-zero band gaps, um, and that's in order to limit dark counts and to maximize the energy that you would get from carrier conversion when your interactions are happening. And I just want to say that on this plot, which I stole uh, from Noah Kurzinski, um, the extent of these arrows is driven by um, fundamental limitations from kinematics and material properties. Um, some, in some cases, we're assuming that large uh, hurdles can be overcome um, in mitigating noise and, and various other factors in order to reach these extremes. So, um, this is somewhat speculative. On that note, um, I want to start by talking a little bit about CREST-3. So the CREST um, experiment has been going on for many years. And one of the, the very nice things, they have this um, nuclear versus electron uh, recoil discrimination where their electrons have this yield, which is the amount of light that they're collecting over their charge. Uh, which is equal to one, and then they can separate out alpha particles from nuclear recoils that are happening on the oxygen or tungsten component of their crystal. Their operating temperature is about 15 millikelvin, um, and they, their recent results have been from a single detector that has had a mass of 24 grams, and their energy threshold is 30 EeV, so this is, this is pretty good. Um, this is just um, taken from one of the recent papers. Uh, this is showing that um, around 0.5 uh, 
um, MEV, they've gotten over a magnitude of improvement. Um, and they've extended their reach from 0.5 GeV to 0.16 GeV. But their sensitivity, as you can see in this plot in the lower right-hand corner, is limited by some unknown background um, around 200 EEV. So their next challenge is to um, try to understand more thoroughly what that background could be. Um, they're currently in a started run three. My understanding is that that actually just started a few days ago. Um, so this is another round with that crystal um, where they've added some additional modifications. Um, and they, um, anyway, so actually I guess that's today that their, their cool down date is. Um, the Crest 3 um, also plans to do a future upgrade for 20 and 21. So we want to upgrade to a 200 readout channels in order to accommodate 100 modules uh, for the oxygen target mask. They have new cryostat cabling um, that's been designed and prototyped. They have sensor development going on that will further push down the detector threshold, which will enable them to see lower mass dark matter. And then they're going to continue studies using alternate detective materials, um, which could yield them sensitivity to spin dependent interactions and not just the standard spin independent interactions. Moving on to super CDMS and Edelweiss. Um, I lumped these two experiments together because they have a similar target and similar technology. Super CDMS uh, Snow Lab is a generation two dark matter experiment that's under construction. Um, it is going to be located at Snow Lab, which has a depth of uh, 6,900 meters water equivalent. So this will uh, result in a factor of 100 reduction in the muon flux from cosmic rays as compared to when the experiment ran at Sudan. Um, the experiment will be housed in the Snow Lab facility, which is a class 2000 or better clean room. The cryostat is going to be able to accommodate up to seven towers, although the initial payload of this experiment is only going to be four towers. Each tower will have six detectors uh, per tower. And in total, we will have 12 of the ISIP detectors, which have the nuclear recoil discrimination, and 12 of the high voltage um, detectors, which give us sensitivity to the lowest mass dark matter. Um, we're expecting an order of 0.1 DRU gamma background, a 15 millikelvin base temperature, and the whole system has vibration isolation. And so one of the things that you'll notice here is that there is room in this cryostat um, to upgrade if, if need be, um, add existing towers, perhaps even add different technologies, depending how it is uh, that the future um, sort of dictates to us that interesting parameter space and technology allows us to go. Uh, Super CDMS at Snow Lab is going to be accessible to a wide variety of dark matter um, interaction types, um, absorption, electron recoil, um, our high voltage and LT detectors uh, will give us sensitivity down to approximately 300 MeV. Um, and then the nuclear recoil detectors will give us um, sensitivity to higher mass dark matter. Um, so a traditional nuclear recoil analysis will use the ISIP detectors. It will be a background free uh, sort of search that gets us above 5 GeV. The low threshold nuclear recoil um, will also use the ISIP detectors, and that is best above a GeV. The high voltage mode of running the detectors, which uses the N nuke, uh, I'm not even gonna try to say it, um, uses the loop gain, uh, will give us the high voltage, but we'll have, it will have no discrimination between nuclear recoils or electron recoils, um, and that will get us down to about 0.3 GeV. Um, we'll also be able to search for electron recoiling dark matter and absorption, so dark photons and axion-like particles. The name of the game really when going forward in these cryogenic technologies, I think, is uh, looking for the single electron hole pair sensitivity. And I should stress this is something that's already been demonstrated, and you'll see that in the following slides, um, but it is something that's important to a number of technologies. Um, and so essentially here using semiconductors becomes um, really important. And in this example um, I'm showing here is the band diagram for silicon uh, where you can see um, its gap energy of 1.2 um, EV. And so by having these electron excitation um, momentum and energy scales, 
they, we can use this in semiconductors to exploit light mass dark matter searches. And so in silicon, um, this is an indirect band cap, which means that it requires a phonon to have for the transition to happen, and it's temperature dependent. Um, the average energy to produce an electron hole pair in silicon is 3.6 eV. And again, that is also temperature dependent. Um, so these types of detectors are sensitive to energy deposits of order eV for electron scattering and order 10 eV for nuclear scattering. And so what you'll notice is, is that the, when we start looking at these semiconductors, as Catherine had hinted to, um, this really starts to put us into the realm of solid state physics. So in solid state physics, we're essentially looking at energies that are less than 30 eV, and you start having to consider these multi-body systems. Um, the allowed energies or momenta are given by dispersion relations, rather than thinking of free particles and our standard E is equal to the momentum divided by the momentum squared divided by um, the mass. And so in solid state physics, particles often will be thought of as having effective masses versus well-defined masses. And so this all presents some challenges. Um, the first is set of challenges sort of fit into the category of the detector response. Um, the details of the band structures in these um, semiconducting devices becomes increasingly important. In order to do the physics, and interpret your results, you need PDFs in order to get the number of electron and hole pairs given an energy deposition. And so this requires uh, FANO statistics, which is dispersion probabilities. Um, currently, they're often ignored or simplified in many of the PDFs that are used, and there are ongoing efforts to improve this. For nuclear recoil, quenching becomes an issue. Um, so for your ionization yield is less than one. It's, as you can see from the symbol plot here, you're not in agreement at low energies um, with the Linhard theory. And so people use sort of a combination of Linhard and empirical um, yields for these quenching factors. And just in general, there's a lack of data at these very low energies. The next thing that you have to consider when you're talking about the detector response is that crystal impurities can lead to partial energy deposits. Um, so this essentially gives you events between your quantization peaks in your readout. And so that could be um, coming from impact ionization. It could come from trapping. Um, you could even get some IR. Then the next category that you worry about is background. Um, the spectral information about radioactive decays at EV scales is required, but how relevant that exposure or, or that information or how relevant that background becomes really is exposure dependent. Um, you have IR and optical phonons, pho I'm sorry, photons that can become si significant backgrounds at the very lowest energies. And then finally, um, your dark current or your leakage current can become very significant and that can also dominate your background at the lowest um, energies. So there are a lot of challenges when it comes to these sorts of devices. Um, so in the next part of the talk, I just basically want to tell you about a few efforts to go measure these sort of single electron, um, or sorry, single electron hole pairs and the types of physics that you can do with it. And so, I mean, this is really desirable, again, because it would give us a variety to, uh, give us sensitivity to a variety of sub-GEV dark matter models. And it can be done with very small exposures, just gram day exposures can make um, significant progress in our knowledge right now. Um, what you're looking at here um, are some recent results from the Super CDMS HV EV detectors. Um, this data was taken with a 0.93 gram silicon crystal operated um, in a dilution refrigerator at a surface facility. And so what you can see here is that you do get quantization. So this is one electron hole, two electron holes, um, et cetera. Um, this exposure for this analysis was just three gram days, which was collected over three days. Um, these detectors were operated at 100 volts. They have an energy resolution of 3 eV and a charge resolution of 0.03 electron volts. Um, calibrations were done uh, with a monochromatic in situ laser um, at 635 nanometers. Um, and 
these analyses are starting to become a little bit more sophisticated where we are actually using data selection criteria to remove leakage events and surface events. Um, in this um, exposure, when doing this analysis, one of the um, advances that was, was important was actually including impact ionization and charge trapping um, into the dark matter models um, when making predictions of what your overall limit would be. Um, Edelweiss is also working on um, HV operation, and they have this red 30 detector. It's a 33.4 gram uh, germanium bolometer um, with an NTD um, sensor. And so this is one of the differences between the Super CDMS and the Edelweiss technology. Uh, Super CDMS uses transition edge sensors to read out their phonon signals, um, where the Edelweiss collaboration uses these bolometers. Their exposure in their most recent run was 2.44 days, and they operated at 78 volts. They had a phonon resolution of 44 eV, and their electron hole, um, so their charge resolution to electron holes was 0.53 um, of an electron hole. Their calibrations are using um, acceptation lines of germanium-71. And so essentially what they do is they activate their germanium detectors with an uh, a um, I'm sorry, an AM beryllium neutron source. And essentially they also have data selection criteria to remove events um, that occur either in the NTD in the, instead of the crystal. Um, one of the issues that Edelweiss is, is dealing with trying to understand better is that they get these events that are heat only events. So um, for some reason, they, these events do not get the amplification that they should from the loop effect. Um, and this is their main source of backgrounds. Um, so they end up with a 10 to the 6 uh, DRU at 10 EV. Um, the dominant limitation, um, this, and, and this, uh, these heat only events becomes the dominant um, limitation um, above um, a three electron hole signal. Um, they have studied many hypotheses um, and what it seems is that there's no single contributor that causes these heat only events. And it may be that they, these events are actually coming from multiple sources, which might make it even more challenging um, to try to get under control. Um, the Sensei experiment is another experiment that's um, using a, a semiconductor using silicon. Um, and basically, this is a CCD type of detector. And so the idea is, is that the dark matter will come in, um, take an electron, kick it up to the, from the valence band into the conduction band, and then um, you can read this out. Uh, Sensei is the first experiment to use um, the skipper technology that uh, Rick had alluded to. Um, they have high resistivity silicon, and their active mass, again, it's a very small active mass, it's 1.925 grams. Um, and the thing here is that um, the electron noise, the skipper readout, makes the single resolution possible. So if you look at the readout noise with a regular CD, CCD, um, this is what, what you end up with. But then if you take a look at the sub-electron noise from the skipper, um, readout, you can clearly see um, the, the electrons um, have, have this very nice um, distinctive signal around, um, around and, and is quantized. Um, DOMIC is another experiment that is taking advantage of CCDs. Um, they also have had some recent results uh, using seven fully depleted CCDs. Um, again, these are, these are very small, um, these are very small sensors. Um, and the, pro the problem that Dominic has had is that they have not yet been able to achieve that single electron hole pair sensitivity. Um, but what Dominic has achieved is the lowest dark count to rate uh, to date. And so if you take a look at the CCD dark count progress, um, what you see is that the general purpose CCDs uh, have a dark count up here, um, you know, around a few. Um, the Sensei prototype that was run um, had a dark count of about one electron per pixel per day. Um, the Sensei prototype um, moves down, um, and this is right here at about 10, I don't know, three times 10 to the minus fourth is the Domic experiment. 
um, that is currently running. And then you can see that the next version of Sensei has this expectation um, that the dark count's even going to become lower. So kind of summarizing where the Skipper CCD plans are, Sensei has moved to Snow Lab. Phase one system is operational um, and the complete experiment will contain 100 grams. The next step after that would be Domic M at Modane. They would operate in Domic M, one kilogram of mass. So they would have uh, 6,000 by 6,000 pixels over nine by nine centimeter um, by one centimeter thick crystal. Um, and then Domic M is actually going to integrate the skipper readout into their technology. Going further into the future, um, there is this idea to have a 10 kilogram skipper CCD detector as well. And R&D is going on into that experiment. So now moving on um, to some other ideas, um, SPICE is a collaboration um, that is trying to use uh, these ionic crystals. So this is a sub-EV polar interactions and cryogenic experiments. Um, Catherine had alluded to this in her talk. Um, the idea here is that in ionic crystals, optical photons um, are oscillating electronic dipoles. Um, they have very large couplings to photons and very large coupling uh, to dark photons. Um, in order to make this technology work, you want to have 30 to 100 MeV phonon sensitivity. Um, and there is an ongoing effort underway in polar crystal R&D using a variety of substrates. And so um, Catherine had, had shown some plots of, of what this technology could lead to in terms of sensitivity. Um, there's a lot of sensitivity going on in energy. Um, it requires you to come up with 10 to 20 millikelvin uh, um, TC tungsten films in order to do the readout. So this again is using like a TS technology for readout. Um, there are investigations in R&D going on in reducing the environmental noise for these types of crystals. Um, and also low stress and low parasitic heating crystal uh, support design. Um, so there is a big effort going on um, to try to use these types of crystals um, perhaps in the even fu further future. Another experiment that I would label as a cryogenic experiment that is um, also, I would say, in, a, an, in an R&D, but very promising R&D mode, is the Herald experiment. So this is the helium roton apparatus of light dark matter. Um, this idea here is to use um, superfluid helium, like a kilogram of it. Um, so this is operated at about 50 millikelvin. And the signal that you're looking for is that um, when you have your particle interact with this helium, uh, you will get quasi-particle excitations in the form of photons and rotons. And you will also get excite, um, atomic excitations, um, ionization, um, which then leads to recombination and excitation, and then just straight to excitation as well. And that produces singlet photons and triplet excimers. In order to make this technology work, um, you actually need to have a readout, um, both wet and dry readout, and the technology that they're trying to use to do that is TES arrays. Um, so another thing to kind of keep your eyes out for. Uh, so in conclusion, um, I haven't uh, gone and taken individual experiments and um, placed them all on a single plot. Um, I think that what we're doing in cryogenic technology is we're going after lots of different models that you could have of dark matter that have light mass. And so what I did instead is I stole from the DOE BRN um, dark matter new initiatives report, um, this plot here, which I think um, these plots kind of show really nicely sort of where the current direct bounds are, um, what we could do in the near term with technology that either exists or will exist very soon, and then looking at far term, where, where we might go in the next, say, decade. Um, these cryogenic te technologies are making quick progress towards lighter and lighter dark matter. And there, I hope I have showed today, there's a healthy mix of existing experiments that are currently upgrading and running that are going to produce results in the near term. Um, and that we also have a very healthy R&D act, um, activities. This single electron hole detection has been achieved by multiple, um, ex ex um, well, I guess 
multiple technologies, and there's still R&D that's needed um, if it is that we really want to exploit um, new parameter space. And then, um, as Catherine had told us in her talk, um, there is large uh, theory space that we can explore in the next decade. Thank you.